the, the normal range is 70 to 105. And my first blood sugar was 200. And so I've now gotten my blood sugars down to about an average of about 115. Or so do it. Mark. Hey, well, so when whoever's cleaning, mute themselves, please. All right. I think I muted everybody accidentally. You didn't mute me, but it stopped everything. <laughs> Did I stop everybody? It stopped the noise. Yeah, I pushed the wrong button. <laughs> Mark, All right. I I think I made it work. Hold on. You know, that noise might be me, man, at my work. Okay, yeah. We'll just, if you don't mind muting, brother. And then if you yeah, have any questions, that's fine. You know, thank yeah, you. Yeah. Appreciate it. I feel like I'm 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 on the Millennial Falcon, Star Wars. And then I hear I hear like a disturb. I'm like, okay, I gotta find it. <laughs> Genesis. So, oh. Awesome. So Jamal, if you're ready, we can we can start, brother. All righty, all righty. Um, you mind? Um, somebody want to open us some prayer, real quick? Anybody? Sure. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you, Lord, that we're able to come together with other uh, believers around the world and to worship you and adore you through your word. Heavenly Father, we pray, Lord, that tonight, yet your word will just come and have its way. We ask, Lord, that you will guide tonight. We ask your will be done, your kingdom come. Today, tonight, we just pray blessings upon uh, Jamal. We ask, Lord, that as Jamal opens this up, that Jamal will get out of the way and let you lead 100%. I pray, Lord, that you will overtake his mind, overtake his works. I pray for everybody on this call, I pray blessings upon their mind. I pray, Father, that you would just regenerate our minds to only think of you, to only want you. Make us more hungry for your word, Lord. Hungry for you, Lord Jesus, not of the things of this world. May this word impact us, explode us for you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you for that. So tonight, gentlemen, we're going to be looking at Genesis chapter 8. Um, last week, our brother John, you did a fantastic job, brother, going through chapters six and seven. I, I was planning on being as auspicious as you and do two chapters, but I'm just going to do one chapter tonight. Um, and so at the, at the conclusion of chapter seven of Genesis, we have a total of eight people, eight souls who have been shut in by God. God shut Noah, his wife his three sons and their wives shut them inside the ark um, along with the animals the creeping things it says in in um, the king james version and all the animals are all shut in this ark and there's like mark said at the beginning of, of tonight's session um, there was one window in the ark and that was you know it was pitched with tar so that thing was like glued shut man it was like water sealed um, so we, we find them at the end of chapter seven on the ocean. Um, and it says that at the end of chapter seven, it, it looks like they were there for five months. Um, it says, just to read the last part of chapter seven here, it says, um, beginning at verse 21, all flesh that moved on the earth perished, birds and cattle and beasts and every swarming thing that swarms upon the earth and all mankind, of all that was on the dry land, all in whose nostrils was the breath of the spirit of life, died. Thus, he blotted out every living thing that was upon the face of the land, from man to animals to creeping things and to birds of the sky, and they were blotted out from the earth, and only Noah was left, together with those that were with him in the ark. The water prevailed upon the earth 150 days. So for about five months, about a five month period of time, man, that, that ark I would imagine is being tossed and, and 
you know, tussled and moved about upon, upon the waters. And we said this last week, up until this point, rain had never fallen on the earth. Man, mankind knew nothing about rain. It had never rained. Um, God himself kept the garden flourishing and, and even when man was kicked out of the garden, man, even though man had to sweat by the, you know, work by the sweat of his brow, he never really, there was no rain to help with what was being planted until Noah's time. And now all of a sudden we're, we're told that waters prevailed from the heavens and the floodgates um, from the ground swelled up and overtook the earth too. So we had, we had two sources of water, both from underneath the ground and from the heavens, all of these waters converging together to cause this flood. And I, I believe last week we spoke also of some striations that appear in like in the Grand Canyon and other places on earth, um, seashells being found in canyons, um, in Death Valley and all over the world. We have, we have these, these things, these, these remains of animals in certain places that aren't there now. So clearly there was some type of cataclysmic universal worldwide flood. And, and we believe it by faith as Christians, um, but I think the science is starting to finally catch up with what the word of God has been saying all along. And so tonight we're going to be looking at um, what, I, what I call the, a second beginning. This is, this is, in many ways we're gonna see tonight that from the point of Noah coming out of the ark, it parallels with the account in Genesis chapter one. We're gonna see some of the same types of language, some of the same concepts being mentioned again. And so we're gonna see that, that, that interplay between chapter one and chapter eight. Chapter one um, is Bereshit, beginning, the beginning, the Hebrew word beginning is Bereshit. But in a very real sense, there's a second Bereshit um, or beginning at the beginning of chapter eight. So it's gonna be really interesting how we look at this. And so what, what I would like to do is begin by reading the entire text of Genesis chapter eight, and then give some analysis and insight and then you guys can jump in at the appropriate time, okay? So we're looking at verse one of Genesis chapter eight. <clears throat> but God remembered Noah and all the beasts and all the cattle that were with him in the ark. And God caused a wind to pass over the earth and the water subsided. Also the fountains of the deep and the floodgates of the sky were closed and the rain from the sky was restrained and the water receded steadily from the earth. And at the end of 150 days, the water decreased. In the seventh month, on the 17th day of the month, the ark rested upon the mountains of Ararat. The water decreased steadily until the 10th month. In the 10th month, on the first day of the month, the tops of the mountains became visible. Verse six, then it came about at the end of 40 days that Noah opened the window of the ark which he had made and he sent out a raven and it flew here and there until the water was dried up from the earth. Then he sent out a dove from him. This is the second um, animal he sends out, the second bird. Then he sent out a dove from him to see if the water was abated from the face of the land. But the dove found no resting place for the sole of her foot. So she returned to him into the ark for the water was on the surface of all the earth. Then he put out his hand and took her and brought her into the ark to himself. So he waited yet another seven days. And again, he sent out the dove from the ark. This is the second time that the dove is sent out. The dove came to him toward the evening and behold, in her beak was a freshly picked olive leaf. So Noah knew that the water was abated from the earth. Then he waited yet another seven days 
and sent out the dove. This was the third time he sent out the dove, but she did not return to him again. Now it came about in the 601st year in the first month on the first of the month, the water was dried up from the earth. Then Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked and behold, the surface of the ground was dried up. In the second month, on the 27th day of the month, the earth was dry. Then God spoke to Noah saying, go out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons and your sons' wives with you. Bring out with you every living thing of all flesh that is with you, birds and animals and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth that they may breed abundantly on the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. So Noah went out and his sons and his wife and his sons' his wives with him. Every beast, every creeping thing and every bird, everything that moves on the earth went out by their families from the ark. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took of every clean animal <clears throat> and of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. That's a lot of animals. Um, the Lord smelled the soothing aroma. And the Lord said to himself, I will never again curse the ground on account of man, for the intent of man's heart is evil from his youth. And I will never again destroy every living thing as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest and cold and heat and summer and winter and day and night shall not cease. I think it's just a, just a beautiful chapter and there's so much to, you know, I wanna take our time tonight to chew on some things here. And I wanna go a little bit almost verse by verse with a quick analysis before I give some evaluation. So in verses one and two, the water that was descending from above the firmament and the waters that were coming from the ground ceased. The, the ground waters stopped rising and rain stopped falling from the heavens. Both sources of water stopped. But just because the waters stopped doesn't mean that the earth immediately went back to its previous state of, you know, dry land all over the place. I mean, if you, I mean, you know, for some of us that live in the Salinas area, I think it was, man, more, more than 20 years ago now, you may remember this, John, I don't know if you were in the area, Mark, but do you remember when Davis Road, that whole swath of land flooded and you couldn't, you couldn't, <laughs> remember that? And you couldn't go down, um, um, what's, what's that? Um, Blanco Road to get to Monterey Marina. I mean, it was, it was, it was like the ocean was there. Imagine, imagine the entire world being underwater. And we're going to talk about that a little bit because that parallels chapter eight, that part parallels chapter one, in which we find the earth entirely covered with water. There's so, some strong correlations in this chapter referring back to chapter one. In verse three of chapter eight, we are told that there was so much water on the earth that it took five months before the water began to recede. And it's, and it's another interesting period of time. At the end of chapter seven, the ark was on the ocean for five months. Rain just coming down and water coming up from the earth. Five months, the ark went through that whole deluge of water everywhere. Now, Chapter eight starts with another five month period of time. I mean, it's five that it was on the water, another five before the water began to go down. So for 10 months, essentially what we're saying here, th this is how much water was on the earth. I don't know if any of you have ever gone on a cruise or, or been out in open sea before. I mean, like really far away where you're far away from the land, you don't even see the land. The ocean is huge. I've been on two cruises. The last one, just before COVID hit, my wife and I, we, we took a flight to Florida. 
And then we went um, to the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico and Belize and Honduras and the Caribbean. When you are out in the middle of the ocean, you realize just how small you really are. The ocean is a very powerful thing. You know, anybody who thinks water is not powerful is, is crazy. This isn't like you're in your bathtub and you're taking a shower. That water is so strong. You feel intimidated when you're on the ocean. I know I do. Um, it may be in part because I don't swim that well, but even if I could, the ocean is no joke. And that's with all this land being available to us. Imagine there is no land. It makes me think of, of this film. It, it didn't do that well, but it was called Water World with Kevin Costner. Imagine an existence where there is just simply no land for you to get to. You can go as far as you wanna go, there is no land. So we have Noah and his family for 10 months, there is no land for them to see. Even if they wanted to try to find land, they wouldn't have found any because the waters were really that high. And then we're told after that 10 month period of time in verse four of chapter eight, that another two months go by <laughs> before the ark rests on Mount Ararat. Man, so it took that long for this water to come down enough for the ark to finally rest on Mount Ararat. And Mount Ararat is in present day Turkey. That mountain range <clears throat> is part of an old the ancient Assyrian Urartu peoples. And the mountain ranges upwards of about 18,000 feet. I looked this up. So those mountains are pretty high. Mount Everest is at 29,000 feet. These mount, the highest mountain here is about 18,000 feet. That is really high, gentlemen. So if, if the ark rested somewhere around 18,000 feet, how high must the waters have been beyond that? And I think chapter, the end of chapter seven speaks about, you know, how many cubits the water was above the mountains. So, but the water was really, really, really high. We're told in verse five of chapter eight, this is three months later, after that 10 month period of time, that other surrounding mountaintops began to be visible. So the ark landed on Mount Ararat, and even then you still could see no other land. Another three months later, now other land um, pieces were being seen. Um, in verses six and seven, we are told that Noah sent a, a raven out of the ark to survey if there's any place for them to go. Has the water dried up? And we're told the raven, the raven never returned. You know, I was looking up um, earlier this week. The raven is really different from the dove. The raven is a very durable type of bird. I mean, the beak is much stronger. Ravens eat all kinds of organisms. They're, they're, they're practically scavengers. They can eat almost anything. And ravens fly longer distances, have a larger wingspan, um, a much more versatile type of bird. When we get to the dove, the dove is a very fragile type bird. And that's an interesting word. The dove is fragile unlike the raven. Um, the raven can eat anything, but a dove is very particular about what it will consume. And then, you know, and there's a, it's almost as if there's some kind of spiritual thing in that too, because we as believers, we're supposed to be particular about what it is we consume. And I'm not just talking about food. It, it, it seems to me, we should be identifying in some kind of um, spiritual way with the dove much more than the raven. We're not supposed to just consume or take anything just because it's there. You know, we're not supposed to just look at anything. We're not just supposed to touch anything just because we can. We're supposed to be partakers of and consuming the things that we should be involved with. And the dove is a very fragile bird and is a very particular and peculiar type bird compared to the raven. Um, we're told in verses eight through nine that now Noah sends the dove out for the first time. And again, the dove was not able to find any place to rest her soul because it's a very fragile type bird. Seven days later, Noah sends the dove out for the second time. This time, on the second time sent out of the ark, the dove returns with an olive leaf plucked freshly from an olive plant. 
And what I discovered is this was a great sign to Noah because olives do not grow at very high altitudes. So if the dove found an olive leaf, olives essentially, that means that the water had receded way past 18,000 feet. So even though the ark was at 18,000 feet, who knows that that olive plant may have been at 4,000, 3,000 feet. It was much lower than where that ark was. So that dove flew down a ways to pluck that olive plant. That's a very interesting fact concerning olives. Then we're told in verse 12 that the dove was sent out for the third time. This time it did not return. So obviously the dove found a place where it could rest. We're told that the flood began in the 600th year on the second month and the 17th day of Noah's life. This is from Genesis 7 and 11. And then on the 601st year in the first month, on the first day of Noah's life, the waters were dried up from the earth. That's in Genesis 8, 13. So that whole time told together is about 13 months or so. So from the time Noah, his family, clean and, and dirty animals went into the ark and they were sealed up, shut tight by God until the time they exited was about 13 months or so. That's how long they were in that ark, okay? Um, we're told in verses 14 through 19 that at that time, this is another two months later, and this is up to the 13th month, that Noah brought his family out and all the animals by the commandment of God. So even though the dove had found an olive branch, which, is a, which was a great sign to Noah, Noah still didn't exit. And then I thought about that. Noah knew that he probably could have exited the ark um, two months earlier. He knew that because the dove didn't return. It's a really interesting thing. The third time he sent the dove out, it did not return. And he waited an additional two months before he exited. And he still didn't leave until God told him to. And we were told earlier that Noah was a very righteous man that walked with God. Man, even, and I think there's a lesson in that for us. When we, when we get ready to do things, do we do, we do them because if we, if we have signs in the natural, if we, if we have experience to know, well, based upon my experience, I know pretty sure that if I do this, it'll be okay. Do we operate that way? Or do we, or do we take things to God and ask him what he wants us to do? Because this is what Noah did. He, and again, he's a upright man. He knew from experience, from knowing that the dove didn't come. Th there's a reason he sent these birds out. He was looking for confirmation. He had confirmation. But even with confirmation, he still did not move until God told him to. Really interesting fact. And we're told that the first thing Noah did once he did leave the ark was he made a humongous sacrifice to God. He took clean animals from every animal and every bird. And we're told earlier that of the unclean animals, he took two of a kind. Of the clean ones, he took pairs of seven. And, and so here, here's something interesting. Why would he take pairs of seven for clean animals and just buy couples of two from unclean? It could very well be because of what he did here. If, if you're going to have this huge sacrifice and worship the Lord like this, you're going to need lots of animals. Because if you just have, have them by twos, you probably would destroy whole species. So he had an overabundance of clean animals on board specifically, man, think about this, specifically to worship God with. Why, why were all those animals there? To worship God with at the appropriate time. That's why they were there. And it's like some of that stuff we, we kind of miss. I didn't even think about it till a little while ago. Why would you have twos here and sevens here? To worship. It, it, it reminds me of when, when Moses later goes before Pharaoh and Pharaoh is hardening his heart and, and Moses is saying, we, we must take our little ones with us and we must take our flock with us to worship the Lord in the wilderness. And Pharaoh at one point said, 
you can you can take everything but leave your leave your your flocks and your herds. And Moses was like, no, we have to take them. We we'll only take a little bit. We have to take everything Moses said because, as he said, we don't know with what we will need to worship the Lord. You don't know exactly what the Lord will require of you in terms of worship. So Moses and the Israelites took all of their cattle. And then we see Noah here, who precedes Moses, taking this abundance of animals to worship the Lord with. That was the purpose, so he could worship the Lord appropriately. This is a righteous, upright man. Noah built this ark. Again, he sacrificed these clean animals. And we find something else very interesting in, in verses 20 and 21, where God begins to talk about how he will, he will no longer, he will not again curse the ground um, that man is living on. And he will no longer destroy the earth with water. And one of the phrases used here is, is it says that for the intent of man's heart is evil from his youth. Continually evil from his youth. We're going to come back to that. And in verse 22, the last verse of that chapter, the Lord promised as long as the earth remains, as long as the common cycle of, of seasons remains, for example, the earth will not cease. Now, looking at some evaluation here. Again, Noah was on the ark for 13 months. When the text says that God remembered Noah, so at, in, in chapter 8, verse 1, it says, but God remembered Noah and all the beasts and all the cattle that were with him in the ark. Sometimes a person might think, remember, did God forget Noah? No, he, did, he didn't forget Noah. That language is used throughout scripture, especially the Old Testament. And when that, that Hebraic phrase is used, then God remembered so-and-so and so-and-so. And so. That just, that, that denotes God's loving care. God is intending to do good to his people. You know, there's a period of time when his people went through something that may not have been very, this is strong, this, this is so powerful here, guys. There's a period of time, this is what the phrase is, is speaking to. There is a period of time when the people of God may have been going through judgment or they may have been going through setbacks or they may have been going through disappointment, whatever it is, but it's just like with the children of Israel and Moses to refer to him again. It says that God remembered his people. This is when they have 400 years of bondage. Then it says God remembered. It's not that God forgot that they were in bondage. God didn't forget that the Israelites were in bondage. It's just that now the appointed time came for God's deliverance. That's what it means when it says, and God remembered. It is time for deliverance. That is what it means. When that phrase was used with Moses, it was time for them to be rescued from, from Egypt. When it is used here with Noah, it is time not just for Noah and his family to be rescued, but for mankind to be rescued. Now is the appointed time. This is what this phrase really means. God is not forgetful. God knows what he's doing. God is not making up things on the fly. His plan is set. And since it's set, this is the set time for mankind to be rescued. That's what the phrase means. This is time for him to show mercy and grace, not forgetfulness. And Genesis 8 is a really interesting book because it repeats much of the first creation in chapter 1 of Genesis. There's, there's this chaos with water. There's this dry land appearing out of the, out of the water. There are birds flying in, in the creation, in the heavens. We have man emerging in, in the, the earlier part of Genesis. We have man being created from the ground. And what do we have here? We have man emerging from the ark. In a sense, the ark is, it symbolizes coming from darkness and coming into light, man. It's like symbolizing coming from death and coming into life. You know, we're, we're told in um, one of Peter's epistles that the going through of the ark for Noah and his family is like going through the waters of baptism. Hallelujah. That, that, that's the figurative language and, and the idea that's involved. It's like when we are baptized, we go under the water, we are identifying with the death of Christ. And when we come out, emerge from the water, 
we are identifying with Christ's life. When those eight souls came through that water, they were there for 13 months when they went through that ordeal and then they emerged by God's command, it was symbolizing coming out of darkness and coming into light, coming out of death, coming into life. This is what this is symbolizing. It's really important for us as Christians to see this. Really important. I keep hearing people ask the question, is baptism necessary for salvation? Now, people say, no, it's not. And other people say, yes, it is. The way I answer that question, and other people may have a different take on this. The way I answer this question is, is that it's a bad question. That's the wrong question to be asking. For me, the question should be this. If you are a Christian, why would you intentionally disobey your master? Did Christ command that we baptize? Yes, he does. And so since your master commanded that you do it, it's a different thing if you live in some far away, remote place, you never heard of Christ, and we refer to Romans chapter one, and you know, creation speaks to the glory of God, and you know, you come into a relationship with God that way. But that's not our case. We've all heard of Christ, we know of Christ. If Christ has told you to be baptized, which he has, he's commanded it, who are you to say, well, all I have to do is just believe and you know, I don't have to be baptized. Baptism doesn't save you. Let me, let me twist it around this way. How many churches do we know of that the pastors of the church will allow people who are unregenerate to be baptized? I don't know of any. You always vet people. You always find out if they believe in God first. Notice how I said that. You believe in God first, which means you've already been saved. And from that basis, then we invite people to be baptized. So to, to ask if baptism saves us is the wrong question. It's the wrong order. That is not how salvation works. Only saved people get baptized. We don't take unregenerate people and then baptize them and then think that's going to save them. So it's just a, just a bad question. And let, let me go back. I'm, I was going off into something else real quick. So in terms of correlations, chapter 1, verse 1, and chapter 8, verse 1, speak of the same thing. The same Hebrew word is used to describe the spirit in chapter 1 and the wind in chapter 8. In Genesis chapter 1, we're told, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And later it says, and the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Chapter 8, verse 1 says, but God remembered Noah and all the beasts and all the cattle that were with him in the ark, and God caused a wind to pass over the earth. The same word, ruach, is used for spirit in chapter 1 and wind in chapter 8. The same word. That's the correlation. The spirit was moving in chapter 1. The spirit is moving in chapter 8. Hallelujah. In chapter 1, verse 7, and in chapter 8, verse 2, we are told that there were waters above the firmament and waters below the firmament. Same language. In chapter 1, verse 9, and chapter 8, verse 5, we are told that the land appears from out of the water. Same thing. I'm telling you. The creation that occurs in chapter one is now being reinstituted in chapter eight. This is the second creation, so to speak. And chapter one, verse 20, and chapter eight, verse seven through 12, we are told about birds taking flight in the heavens. Same correlation. And finally, in terms of correlations in this chapter, chapter eight, verse 17, correlates to chapter one, verse 25, when it speaks of all of these multitude of animals now replenishing the earth and roaming on the earth. Same thing. So chapter one is a creation story. So is chapter eight. And, you know, this is where we are as Christians. We are a creation story. We are told that we are a new creation in Christ. That's what we are. We are a creation story to mimic what is going on here. And so Noah, sometime um, in the month of April or May, the ark was opened, and then Noah and his family and the animals came out of the ark. One of the most universal signs in this chapter is the dove. I mentioned the dove earlier. 
And it's amazing that no matter what religion a person belongs to, even if you're a secularist, even if you're an atheist, everyone on the planet knows that a dove with an olive leaf in its beak is a sign of peace. Everybody knows it. And that's interesting. People who deny God know that that symbol means peace. And, and God means for us to understand that because God is making peace with man. Man is not making peace with God. This second creation story is God himself being our peace. God stepping in, getting away, pushing away the darkness and bringing light back into the creation, showing that he is bringing peace back to us. The question is, what are we going to do with this peace that has been restored on the earth? This is what that bird, the dove, symbolizes. And again, I think it's interesting that the dove is sent out three times. Hallelujah. Man, three times. That has to mean something. I can't, I can't go into how much it might mean, but it just seems to me that that number three and a symbol of peace, God is saying something really powerful to us guys. That's what I think. Um, it, it is important to note, again, that the first thing Noah did when he exited the ark was to build an altar. And here's something. I didn't notice this until I started looking at it this week. In verses 1 through 19 of chapter 8, the only word used for the creator is God. When, when Noah exits the ark, the word God is not used anymore in the chapter. It's the word Yahweh. So, so Noah is communicating something else. He is no longer just saying God. It was God when the waters were on the earth. It was God when, when the ark was tossing here and there. It was God when, when the ark was sealed up. But when God said, exit the ark, now it's Yahweh. When, when it's time to slay clean animals, now it's Yahweh. Everything is Yahweh now. It's no longer the familiar name, God. Now it's, it's the name above all names. Now, now it's the self-existent one. Now it is the one who has no beginning or, or any end. Now Noah is worshiping that way. From the time he leaves this, this arc of 13 months in this world of darkness. Because, I mean, there, there, there couldn't have been light shining into that arc. They were literally sealed up. And he emerges into the light and he's praising Yahweh. That's what he's doing here. Um, again, in verse 21, we're told that the intent of man's heart is evil from his youth. Even that parallels Genesis chapter 6, verse 5 where it says that, um, that the thoughts of their hearts was only evil continually. We are told something about mankind. We don't know how to approach God. We don't know how to do it. And every time we try to on our own, in our own strength, it is wickedness. It is evil. It is always about self-interest. And twice in two chapters, the writer of, of um, Genesis tells us that in Genesis 6 and 5, and also here in um, the 8th chapter, verse 21, we're told that our, our ways are not his ways, like it says in Jeremiah. Our thoughts are not his thoughts. We're wicked. Apart from God, we are wicked. Um, the, here's something else be, before I finish. There, there's something I discovered concerning verse 22, the last verse of this chapter. In verse 22, chapter 8, it says, while the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. Again, it says, while the earth remains, keep that in mind. And what I discovered is that there is a particular group of people who call themselves Christians, who have a different take on that. And in fact, their particular Bible from 1984, I'm talking about Jehovah's Witnesses here, guys. In the New World Translation of 1984, when you look at what they say, according to their translation of Genesis 8:22, they say this, for all the days the earth continues, 
seed sowing and harvest and cold and heat and summer and winter and day and night will never cease. It's similar to what our Bibles will say, but their 2021 version changed that. It's not what it says anymore. And this isn't the first time they've changed the word of God. They've manipulated it, bent it to fit their own agenda, their own doctrine, and it's, and it's controlling people and it's telling lies to people. This is what their 2021 version says. From now on, the earth will never cease to have sowing and harvest and cold and heat and summer and winter and day and night. Do you hear the subtle difference? And this is, this is what Satan does. This is what Satan does. Just like in the garden. Did God say he will take the truth and instead of it being like this, he will bend it just slightly. It's almost there, but I'm going to tweak it just a little bit. See, what our Bibles tell us is that these normal periods of seasons and heat and temperature changes and all sorts of things that, that are fine-tuned, they will continue as long as the earth continues. But that's not what Jehovah's Witnesses say. They essentially say the earth will always continue. They don't, they don't make it contingent. Our Bibles make it contingent. The Lord says it's contingent. Because again, we, we have to look at this. God says in this chapter, he will never again destroy the earth with water. Notice, that doesn't say he will never destroy the earth. I hope you guys are hearing what I'm saying, man. This is how the enemy twists things. And this is what the Jehovah's Witnesses have done. They've taken this verse, verse 22, to make it mean that God will never be about destruction again. This is what they've done. As if evil has not flourished again and God will not deal with it like our Bible say he's going to deal with it. And so, for example, um, in Psalm 75, verses 2 through 3, Psalm 75, I'm going to pull it up real quick. Two through three, it says this. When I select an appointed time, it is I who judge with equity. The earth and all who dwell in it melt. It is I who have firmly set its pillars. This is God talking. So while Jehovah's Witnesses and other false teachers will have these doctrines which will suggest or say blatantly, oh God, he's just, he's love. He's not, he's not going to punish. The earth will never be destroyed again. He promised in Genesis 8, he'll never destroy the earth again. That's not what he promised. He promised never to destroy it with water again. He never says he will just never destroy it, but people have twisted it. I'll give you a couple more verses. Isaiah 24. And then I'll open it up to questions or comments. Isaiah 24, 5 through 6. The earth is also polluted by its inhabitants, for they transgressed laws, violated statutes, broke the everlasting covenant. This is way after the time of Noah. Therefore, a curse devours the earth, and those who live in it are held guilty. Therefore, the inhabitants of the earth are burned, and few men are left. And if that's not enough, we go to the New Testament in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 7, we find these words. But by his word, the present heavens, listen to this. This is in, this is in the first century Peter is writing this. But by his word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. And if that's not enough, he goes on to say in verses 10 through 13, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and its works will be burned up. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, very clear, since these things will be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? And it goes on and on and on. Looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens, <laughs> the heavens will be destroyed by burning, and the elements will melt with intense 
heat. This is what, so look, the scripture is clear. The Lord destroyed the first creation, judged the first creation by water. He shall judge again because he shall come again. And this time it will be by fire. And with that, gentlemen, I conclude. Open it up for comments and, and questions. Well done, sir. Well done. Excellent. Judgment, judgment by fire, it means um, what? That means judgment by Jesus, right? Because doesn't Jesus' angel appear to John uh, in Patmos with the tongue of flame, right? That's judgment. Yes, and I think it, it may also be referring to the ultimate judgment of the ungodly in terms of the lake of fire and death and Hades and the Antichrist, the beast. I think it's referring to that too as well. I like what you said about the birds. You know, the uh, the raven, it says that the raven went to and fro on the earth. And we look at in uh, Job, uh, Satan come into uh, God's throne room and God said, where have you been? And he said, I've been going to and fro. Mm -hmm. And I, I just, I love how you tied the, the raven and the dove into, you know, spiritually what we're supposed to be. Hey, Jamal, just uh, wanted to bring something up here as you were reading about all the days that were spent in, you know, in the flood. Um, what I was saying, there's some feedback here. M mute your cell phone or whatever. That'll fix it, probably. Is there is there feedback again? No, you fixed it. Okay, so, um, and uh, he sent out a dove three times in seven-day intervals. Um, and then he remained in the ark so many days. Uh, I, I happened to do a study I studied up on some cross references on that and some commentaries. And if you notice, all those days add up to 364 days. Hmm. So God is establishing the year interval there and sending out the dove uh, at seven day increments equals 21 days. He was, he was establishing the months of the year. You see that at the at the end also. Okay, we see that. You see, you see that, that at the end, end of chapter, chapter eight, where he's not only establishing what my dad, dad said, said, but he starts. starts you see how he separates, separates the summer, summer winter, 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 everything. Can you hear, Can you hear me? me? Yeah, you're echoing now. I'm echoing. Okay. Two of you. What's going on? There's feedback between you and I. Is it because we're too close? Yeah. Yeah, you guys have to mute when either of you are talking because you're in the same house. Can you hear me now? I'm going to go downstairs. Oh, Walter's Mark, in Mark, town? Mark's in, my, Mark's in my house. Oh, you guys. Oh, you're in California. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah he came down to visit. I'll go downstairs. I think it's cool. I'm going to, I'm going to jump, jump off a little bit what my dad was talking about. You, you see how he's establishing... Not, not just how we could bring it up seven seven, seven but he's also not establishing just, just the weeks, but also the the years. I mean, the months, like uh, the summer, winter, as we see down here at the bottom. But I would say, Jamal, what you're talking, the biggest thing that kept hitting me, and it will for a while, is that God. I think we need to marinate on this a little bit. God shut the door. What's that? That, that is showing not just of what the ark living inside us but it shows you that god brought the animals god brought god basically built the ark god does pretty much everything if we actually really think about it wait wait a minute god gives faith uh-oh some measure of faith i'm not going to say how or why because i don't know but it seems like god does it seems like 95 <laughs> percent, and it's like there's like a five percent left almost and it shows you that when you give your life to God, at least to me, that when you give your life to God, God seals you just like he sealed Noah in the ark. So he ha he's sealing us. Remember Paul said, he talks about us being sealed in Ephesians. See, we're sealed 
and then we're bought. We're, bought, we're sealed and then we're bought. And the cool thing is when he was on that cross, I believe right when he took his last breath, that's when we became sealed because it was the blood. The blood had to be shed. The blood had to be spilled. Jesus had to die. In order for Jesus to die, now we're safe in the door because there's only one door on that ark and that one door was standing for the truth, the light. There's only one way. You can't go through the behind. There was not a behind door, a side door, one door and one window. And that window was representing the window in heaven. It talks about in the book of, uh, I believe, Psalms and Proverbs. Anyways, that's all I got. I get excited, Jamal. I love it. Love it. Love it. Of course, the uh, it is finished is also interpreted as paid in full. Yes. Which was prophecy in the book of Isaiah for that. Mm -hmm. hmm. oh. Come on, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling it tonight. Come on, guys, let's open this up, man. We're having some fun now. The Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, obviously, the, the, uh, the flood was, was judgment, right? And it yes. didn't, didn't destroy yes. it, just filled it with water and killed everything. But <clears throat> the Bible is so small, the, the type is so small, they can't read it. That's the reason they're who they are. <laughs> you know, when you take yeah. the scriptures and you, you twist them up and you purposely change the words to fit your doctrines. Exactly. Um, but they don't believe in hell. So they believe in annihilationism. annihilationism. So there's something there's something there about you know Jesus Jesus talked about hell. It's a, it's a real place. There's real judgment that comes from God. And Christians and pagans alike should take note of it. Because you know there's a reason why Jesus died to save us from something. There was nothing to save us from. He didn't have to die. Come on. Right. And and it's so bad that it took God to So it's just super interesting to think that what Satan's always attacking from, from the standpoint of I don't want people to know or to believe that God will actually judge something. Right, right. That's right. You know, and it's kind of like, you know, what you said there is Adam is incredible. It's kind of like you guys have heard or you know the concept of once you tell a lie, you got to tell another one and another one to support the lies that you told previously. Because if because if you don't, the whole thing unravels. So you got to keep telling lies to make the story sound halfway truthful. And this, you is what, lie. this is what Jehovah's Witnesses have done to your point. Because, because they believe in annihilation and believe that no one will ever be burning forever, they have to change other things that relate to it. That's the only way they can make their doctrine believable to people who will believe it. You've got to tell a lie to make the lie of another lie of another lie believable. That's what they do. So everybody's pretty much just defending the founding father of the congregation, of their denomination. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, yeah, the, big, uh, the big problem with Jehovah's Witnesses is uh, what Jesus said. He said, unless you believe I am who yeah. I say I am, exactly. you will die in your sins. And uh, I use that on them all the time because that's the... And also, uh, of course, uh, John 1.1, 1, 1, I, I, I argued with uh, Jehovah's Witness today on that. Uh, I don't, I, if he was coming back from yesterday... I was telling them that the New World Translation was no good. And I told them that there's 52 versions of the Bible in Bible Gateway, and not one of them translates that the way you do. You know, it's crazy. I I, uh, I went and bought a Jehovah's Witness, uh, their Bible, at the Bible bookstore one day. I was like, you know, for five bucks. And I decided I'm going to go in there and I'm going to redline everything that's in error. And 
by the time I got done with the first page, that entire page was in red. <laughs> see, they the very old package red pens. See, they're in their Bible, red <laughs> they don't believe as Jesus or God as a the ultimate <laughs> deity. They say in their Bible, they say, and a God did this. Right. And a savior did this. Mm-hmm. So so every A in there was redlined. Mm-hmm. Well, just uh, on the cover of their Bible, or uh, of the Book of Mormon anyways, it says, A another gospel, or A another testament. Uh, that, that threw up red flags for me. Right. Yeah. So they, 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 they try to use scripture, but they twist it. Mm-hmm. Big time. They don't tell you who their translators are either because they're not well qualified. That's a very good point, John. When when I look when I look in here, I, I, I don't find it. When, when I was looking at the Jehovah's Witnesses about it, because you want to confirm things. I asked, well, who are the editors? Who are the people who actually translated the your version of the Bible, as you say, directly from the oldest? Hebrew and, and Greek manuscripts. They don't know. The hat. Because they don't list it in their Bibles. They don't list the people who translated it. They just say, they just say the New World Bible Translation Committee. Well, who New are World. Yeah, it was in their Bibles called the New World Translation. Mm-hmm. But then and, and again, the, well, the Mormon Bible, that's I've heard that they've it's been revised over eight thousand times. Like, uh, hey, let's get it right, brother. Book of Mormon? The Book of Mormon, yeah. Uh huh. Uh-huh. Well, didn't Joseph Smith? Didn't Joseph Smith supposedly uh, uh, translate the tablets with a seer stone as like a rock and a hat, something like that? Uh, that's what I'd heard. Yeah, the golden tablets, I think. Yeah, use some sort of voodoo to translate them. Yeah, I mean, who knows? I yeah. mean, you then know, they disappeared, guys. <laughs> yeah, and then they disappeared. <laughs> or I mean, it was reformed Egyptian language that doesn't even exist, and you had to have Harry Potter glasses to translate. <laughs> This Sorry, thing. guys, I had a boating accident. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> exactly. No, seriously, he had to. He had to go like this, bro. He he had to. He had the tablets. He had to take his Harry Potter glasses and be like, "Yeah." <laughs> <laughs> Harry Potter. Oh, <laughs> you know that, man. <laughs> that, dude. Like, come on, man. You couldn't come up with something better than that. I got to put some spell. <laughs> To translate, to translate. It's know? one of the first seeker-friendly new world, uh, new age uh, religions. I mean, goodness, guys, I, I think that's pretty good. How many wives can I have? You know. <laughs> well, yeah, but then they also put, you know, they basically, uh, you know, Jesus is is just Michael the archangel incarnated. You know, mm-hmm. so. Jesus isn't Christ. Jesus isn't God in the flesh. He's he's Michael the Archangel. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's blasphemy. Yeah. It it's is. Panic as it gets, you know. It doesn't matter what the <laughs> Bible says when they talk God talk about things because I mean Hebrews says that Jesus is far above the angels, you know. So yeah. but that doesn't matter. <laughs> they don't read that part. So well, they they change it probably. They keep working on it all the time. They have to because people keep finding stuff to find Jesus. It's the Bible. I mean, geez, they they ha- they can do a lot of things to it, but it's still going to have something in there. <laughs> yeah, and that you know that's that's you know why it was so important to read in uh, Genesis one when we were studying about the deception of Eve, how Satan used scripture and he twisted it yeah and you know he he told her he is you know surely you'll be like god i mean as if god was holding out on her and so 
all these other religions are going to take the word of God and they're going to twist it. It's like they're trying to play whack-a-mole with the Bible. Yeah. Every time Jesus pops up, they try to pop him back down. Jamal, uh, uh, where do you get those? What's that again? What is that you was holding there? Oh, that's one of my granddaughters right there, man. Oh, well, where do you get one of those? <laughs> You're going to have to ask my son that one. <laughs> Which one? Is that Sace? That's um, Elijah. Daniel? Huh? Oh. Yeah. So. Oh. Hey, Jamal, my. can you go? Oh can my. you go a little? Deep, can you expound a little bit on the aroma? Well, well, here, here's one thing. I know, I'll, I know, I know you want to, Jamal. Actually, I, I'll say one thing. You probably have something else. One thing <laughs> I discovered. I just discovered it today. Um, let me see if I. Where is it at? Well, um, like we know, Noah's name means rest, right? Yes. Come Noah's name yeah. means rest. Yes. And so um, let me pull this up real quick. That's because okay. remember, we are the aroma to Christ, as it says in Second Corinthians uh, two fourteen, and then also in Ephesians five two. Right, but this the one of the things I discovered is that the that we know that Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible, so Moa wrote this account. Okay, Moses did. And yep. Moses actually uses a play on words hmm. for the, the sweet smelling savor. Mm -hmm. um, man, where is it at? <coughs> okay, so Noah, his name is Noah. That's how you pronounce it. Noah. But the word sweet is pronounced this way. Strong's H, 5207. Nehoah. Nehoah. So sweet is Nehoah, and Noah is Noah. So mm -hmm. Moses, he played a little, it's a play on words. It's almost as if God is saying, that what Noah offered was it made he himself sweet to God. Okay. You know, it's kind of like that. That what what Noah offered, God took as a sweet savor. But in a in a sense, it's almost as if God is saying, Noah, you yourself are the sweet savor to me. That's a trip to me, man. That's a trip when you look at those two words. I like that. Cause you're right, because it's very close. It's, hmm. you know, it's Gil, uh, comments on that that it is uh, also a savor of rest. Um, who does oh. that? Yep. John Gale's a Cal Calvinist. See, see there's see, there's some there's that dual thing going on there. Hmm. You know, there's also a dual going on it, when we read that. Hold on. When we read that word it says in eight. Chapter 8, then verse 21. And when the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of man, for the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. What really hit me, and I just kind of circled, was when it says the word, the Lord smelt that offering, and he said it was a pleasing aroma. What's interesting about that, we see this because when we go to, when we take a look at, if we all go to Ephesians 5, 2, we're going to see the same wording for fragrance that's used here. And what's cool about it, look at the wording that's used, but it's the same Hebraic word. It says, Ephesians 5, 2, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. That's the same wording, the same wording for, for the offering. Yeah. So we see here, we see here that that's a cross reference pretty much from Genesis 8, 20 to 21, whatever. But what's, what's really sweet about this is that it pleased God. And what also pleased God when Jesus died on that cross, he became that aroma. 
he became that incense unto the father and he smiled and he's well done. This was I'm, who I'm well pleased in. So we see that same offering. Amen. It makes him happy. And we're the same way. Well, you know, that's we're meditating on God. We're becoming that, that not just that offering, but that sweet aroma, yes. the incense up into the heavens. Amen. Yeah. And you know, that, that's the whole purpose of the burnt offering. Yeah. Is that aroma. Yes. yes. That, Amen. that something had to die. Yes. And was consumed by fire. It was that aroma. That's it. That's that it. pleasing to God. I just love these studies. Man. It's, it's, it's so rich. It, we can go so deep. And it just, because God is that deep. We can't even, we can't even delve into all of what God is, man. Bro, bro, brother, we don't even know what's going on. We just, we get to join the party. Yeah, <laughs> we're, yeah we're just, we're just conveyors of the message. <laughs> I mean, when you see that God shut the door, I, I, I keep going back to that because there's a lot to that. When he comes inside us, he finishes it, the completion. He's that unknown author that they have those paintings where it shows the one footprints in the sand. Mm -hmm. He's that. He's the one walking us over, over to the other right. side because he lives inside us. If he lives inside us, he will finish it to completion. He will. Because he our works, any good works that we do, we're already prepared before the foundation of this world to please mm -hmm. God. So if we have to keep saying yeah. we got to be good, we got to be good. It's like, yeah, of course you got to be good. The Holy Spirit lives inside you, yeah. man. Then it becomes works. And yes. then we have to enjoy this peace. I'm speaking more to me than anybody. I'm speaking more to myself because I struggle with that. <laughs> well, we're just along for the ride. And I keep saying that because it's not us who's doing anything spiritual. <laughs> we're, we're just along for the ride. Jesus Christ is leading our path. Come on. And, that, and that's, something, that's something I didn't I didn't see until today when you say Jesus Christ is leading our path. It's like I, I didn't see this until today when I was studying this. I didn't see it on the other days. And that is Noah had a reasonable idea as a human being yep. that the land was dry enough, perhaps, for him to get out of the ark two months before the time was that he actually did. But he still didn't move, man. He waited until he heard from God. He waited until God led him to open up the ark and let everybody every, everything out. You know, and it's and it's you know, and it's one of those things where if Noah had prematurely opened the door of the ark, maybe some animals might have died. And you know, because God knows best. And I think there's a lesson embedded in there for us to really be in tune with the leading of the spirit. Mm. Just hear yeah. from God before we start to make decisions we really shouldn't be making. Amen. It might have been a bit of cabin fever there, don't you think? Yeah. Boy. And, and you know, that the, the cool thing about it is that in, in Hebrews, it talks about Noah. It was, it was rendered to Noah as, as righteousness and, and Abraham as righteousness. For the, and the reason was that he, they simply believed God. That's it. God said, build an ark. He, he said, how high? <laughs> it didn't sound like Noah had a lot of input. <laughs> Not. <laughs> Jamal, Not. you guys got to check this out. I want you guys to grasp this. Just check. This is awesome. So in 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, uh, verse 12 just pay attention this is awesome when i came to trios to preach the gospel of christ even though a door circle was open for me in the lord talking about opening doors my spirit was not at rest because i did not find my brother titus there so i took leave of them and went on to macedonia the kicker's coming. The, the door was just a clencher. But thanks be to God, who in Christ always leads us in triumph. In, uh, 
in triumphal uh, procession and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. For we Amen. are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To one, a fragrance from death to death. To the other, a fragrance from life to life. Woo. Amen. Yeah. We're his wow. fragrance, man. Like, yeah. I want to be a good fragrance. I won't be smelling like no chocolate, you know? I want to eat it, but I won't be smelling. Anyways. That's just awesome. The door, the fragrance, it's like all wrapped up in there. My wife says I have a fragrance. <laughs> Is that some strong BO? <laughs> Sometimes. You're darn tootin'. And um, <laughs> the devil, when he said that he, the Lord opened up a door for him, but he didn't walk through it because of his brother that was not there and chose to go somewhere else instead. You know, and I, I remember we were talking yesterday, Mark, about as people that are filled with the Holy Spirit. And, you know, it's always a question of, you know, um, you know, I, I, I want, I want God to tell me what to do. You know, I want, I, I want to be led by God. I want to wait. You know, Jamal was talking about, about Noah, right? Like he didn't move till God moved. Bingo. But, but the thing is, is uh, notice how Paul moved and he didn't, he didn't move through the door God put there and God still went with him. And God still did big things over there because he's talking about the ministry he was doing there and the fragrances and everything. Right. So that's what I was talking about earlier about, you know, wherever we go, God's going to go with us. Adam, you're right, but he also got a thorn in his side. That's good, Adam. That's you, you, man. That's powerful right there. What you just said. You're right though. There you are. Well, well, you know, it's, it's it's the stinking thinking about, you know, you're going to analyze till you're paralyzed, yeah. right? Yeah. It, 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 ignorance on fire is better than knowledge on ice, man, right? And so if we're always waiting to hear from God, hear from God, hear from God, you know, we're, we're in mortal bodies. We're, 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 we're struggling. We're struggling to hear the 90 different voices that are speaking to our minds every day. Our wife, our kids, our kids the tv our boss our friends our fr you know it's like the devils that are trying to get at us but when paul has a door wide open he knows it's there but guess what i'm thinking about my friend titus right like where's my boy at mm -hmm. i ain't walking through that door without my boy like we gotta go get we gotta go so it's just interesting that an apostle can have a door open we can have doors open and, and go over here. And we have to understand that Jesus is in us. He goes yep. where we go. Okay? He goes where we go. And he directs us as we go, even if we go one way or we go the other way, right? Come on, put your Jesus goggles on. But if you're saved... But if you're saved, it means even more because as the scripture says, man plans his ways, but God directs his footsteps. So if you go left, but you want to go right, you're still going God's direction because God's living inside you. He's going to have his way no matter what. Well, he's, the, he's the master weaver. Probably. Okay. So I'm just saying, you know. Hmm. That's, with, it's a good, I like that. But with I'm my, looking at, I, I like that, but what about Joe? I look at Joseph in the Bible. Right. Like some of the, the patrons that, I like what you said about Paul, by the way, that was, that was awesome. But like when I think of, when I think of that, I start thinking of Joseph, someone that just was after God's heart. Like, I really believe it should have been at the end. And Joseph was a man after God's heart. That's our earthly. Cause we're like, Oh, David don't deserve that after all the stuff he did, but he still gave it to David. But what I loved about Joseph, I would rather have the heart of Joseph because he was so obedient, man. Like, I love David, but he just kept falling and everything, which represents us because we do that a lot. But Joseph, dude, to run from, dude, he literally ran from sin, 
from pornography, from everything, because he wanted to be that pleasing aroma to God. You know, there's issue. something beautiful so about I'm, him. I'm more, to, I'm more talking about, that, that's awesome. That's, I mean, of course, but I'm more talking about, I, I, you know, I'm not talking about the sin stuff. I'm talking about just the everyday living and going and moving like we're yeah. moving we're going and we're doing right and and just having the ability to know i've seen this happen in my father's life ever since i was a little kid you know where he is a vagabond he'll travel the whole world he'll travel he can go anywhere and what he does is just say holy spirit jesus let's go I don't know where I'm going. I don't know where I'm supposed to go, but we're going to go and you're going to do things. Right. So that's all I'm saying. That's just the only little distinction I thought yeah. was cool off of Paul's little tangent there was that, you know, we don't always have to, if, if in other words, if we don't hear something from God, like if we don't, if, if we don't feel like we're hearing something, so we don't want to do something right. Um, that's okay. Because when you go, he's going to use you. Yeah. You know, I, I agree, so I'm going to use an example. The word, when you're talking, and I agree with you 100% on that, but then I also look at the flip coin. A lot, a lot of us are very impatient people. We have this ADHD little hamster inside us where if something happens, we got to we gotta go somewhere, we got to go, we got to do this. And still, God says, be still, and then we don't. I remember when I went through my divorce, I wasn't still. I wasn't still, I went and did stupid. I went and became a serial dater. I, I, I just went wherever the heck I wanted, trying to find, and even though God was there with me and I was doing stupid because of my pain, yeah. what I should have done, and I'm not trying to say what, and I'm saying this, yeah, what I should have done was when I went through the divorce, press deeper into the God, deeper, not into lust of the world, what I was missing what I've been missing, but I should have went deeper in God with my yeah. brother. I didn't do that. And I have consequences for that. Now mm. I would have started all over. I would have yeah. be still. And then Jesus says, my sheep hear my what voice. And you know what? We have a hard time being still, man. I'm saying for me, yeah, not anybody else, but I see the other hedge of the coin. Well, a, a good a good example of that is like the feeding of the five thousand. You know, the disciples came up to him and said, "Lord, it's getting dark. There's we better send these guys home. There's no food." And Jesus challenges them and says, "You feed them." And they looked at each other and they they did they scrambled around in the flesh trying to solve the equation and they come back with a little boy in his lunch he had a loaf of bread and three fish and jesus shook his head and says bring the boy to me and he started dividing all this food what he's trying to teach them in that challenge was apart from him we cannot do one thing exactly not one thing and that's true today we live our we're like those we're like those vacuum cleaners that are ele the electric vacuum cleaners that we're cruising along in life until we hit a brick wall and then we turn and we go another direction see god is using our surroundings he's using our circumstances Amen. to get us to turn in the direction where he's leading us Amen. because we don't we don't know where to go that's right there's one thing yeah. missing from this guys and that is that uh, this week uh, the, on the Quora, they asked me, I asked, uh, what did we learn from the call of Isaiah? What would you learn from the call of Isaiah? Let me just read a little bit of that. Not the wrong one, about here. Wrong Isaiah? I was saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, here I am, send me. And he said, go and tell these people, you hear indeed, but you don't understand. And you see indeed, but you don't perceive. Make the heart of this people fat. Make their ears heavy and they shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears 
and understand with the heart and turn again and be healed. Well, it goes on to say that uh, he's going to fail. That's what I'm trying, that's what I would like for you guys to have uh, that also in this equation. You were talking about, you know, that God will be, uh, will lead you, he'll be with you. Amen. But not every time is there going to be something that you would say is a success story. Right. You know, sometimes as Isaiah, he was a failure. So was Jeremiah. Yes. Uh, the prophets many times were failures. Don't count on a being as a big success. Now, I, I know this pretty well because I preach in a restaurant. <laughs> I don't get too many people breaking down and crying, coming up to the altar and saying, I'm a sinner. I don't get very many of that. But yet, um, it's, uh, it, is, um, it may seem futile what I'm doing or anything might seem futile to you, but doing, being obedient is the main thing, doing what God tells you, whether you, whether you see the fruit or not. That's all I wanted to say. No, that's, that's balanced. That's very, that's excellent because you're absolutely correct. Sometimes we define success differently than what it is to be successful spiritually. And success really is, did you do what God told you to do? And that's, that's its own reward. That's it. Well, whether you see the result you think you're going to see. Yeah. Or not. And, and another thing too, I want us to go back to what Adam said a moment ago. Uh, and I and I think it was just powerful what you said there, Adam. A few weeks, I'm I'm reading the Bible in a year right now, and I was reading through Deuteronomy, and I can't remember the exact text, but I, I do remember I had read this portion of scripture where God gave this happens too. God gave Moses a commandment to give to the people. And then Moses gave the people that command but he did something different with it. It was as if God gave him the general thing to do, but God didn't give him the specific thing of how to do it. And then Moses took the general command and he was creative with how he went about doing it. And I think that happens with us sometimes too, with God. God may give us something, but he may not give us all we think we might need in order to do it. And I think when God does that, because we are already in close relationship with him, hey, brother, baby. There's, enough, there's enough of God in us, and God expects us to just go and do, even if we don't have all we think we might need. If God already gave you a general idea of do something, go in faith. He's going to be with you, whether you fail, as John is saying, or whether you succeed. It doesn't matter. If he gives you a little bit, just take it and go. Because yep. to not move is disobedience. Just go. Just trust that you're gonna. He's gonna be with you, and you just do it anyway, even if you don't have all the particulars you think you need. Noah was a failure too, by the way, wasn't he? He well, preached for for a hundred years. <laughs> not one convert. <laughs> and you know, Jamal, the saying goes with when. They commanded, jo uh, the Lord commanded Joshua to, to cross the Jordan. He says, as your feet hit the water, yes. I will part the waters. But he was challenging them to move forward. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that he will be with us. See, God knows our future. He knows what's going to happen down the road. So when we pray, we're not asking God like a genie in a bottle to do stuff for us. In our situation, we're asking God what it is to give me understanding of my situation. He already knows the outcome. We're not we're not asking in something new. When you come in across a situation, say your prayer should be, God, I need understanding and and why this is happening to me. And not you know, come come down from heaven and fix it. Right. And, and, you know, and to your point, when you talk about Joshua, I know you're going to be all over this, Mark. Even before I just read today about the death of Moses, before Moses died, what does he say to Joshua? Be strong and courageous. 
And that same, that same wording God gives to Joshua at the very beginning of the book of Joshua. But it started with Moses saying this to him. And I think sometimes it's what we need to be hearing. Because when God will tell us to do something, we may not have all the pieces we think we need. But just be courageous and do it anyway, man. Just be strong anyway. He gave you something. Just, just run with that. He, I think God wants us to not be afraid. We can't, we can't, yeah. we can't be paralyzed, like Adam was saying, and overanalyze. That's a great phrase, by the way. Yeah. Just, uh-huh. just move. Be decisive. If God, God is already with you, just move. Yeah. Analyze till you're paralyzed. Yeah. Yeah. And see, and see, this is a word of encouragement, oh, yeah. brothers, yeah. is that we, we need to understand this one thing that. God is the author and the perfecter of our faith, and he will complete in us what he has set out to do. Amen. We, we don't see it. We, we can't see it. We have to come by faith and trust in the Lord. Okay, okay Lord, I'm a big failure. Well, well, maybe there's a reason for that. Maybe he's trying to guide you somewhere. Come on. What happens in you is more important than what happens to you. Come on, John. Let it go, brother. Yeah. You know, that's the confidence we have walking in Christ is that we don't make the right decisions. (laughs) And God knows that. He is going to put us in circumstances to make the right decisions. That he will do. And that's guaranteed. The best thing that can happen is God goes with you. The worst thing that happens is God abandons you. The, the one thing that I, that, that was good, John. Um, <laughs> the one thing that I know, that I know that I know is that every day, God doesn't have to come down and lump us on the head with this one. Jesus wants us to be walking in the spirit. And he wants us to be waging war on our sin. Mm-hmm. Yep. He wants us to be waging war on our sin. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So how do we wage war on our sin, Adam? You have to walk in the spirit. And so yeah. when you're tempted to sin, you have to take that, that power from the Holy Spirit and you have to use it to conquer the urge, yes. flesh, to sin. And oh. every time you do that, the enemy diminishes. The doors that have given him authority in your life begin to close. And then if you really want to know what God wants you to do, get the sin out of your life first. And in, in, in the sense of not because God can't do anything, but because when you're close to God in the sense of you're not grieving the Holy Spirit, even, even the littlest sin at our age with the amount of time we've spent with Jesus and the Holy Spirit, when we knowingly sin, we knowingly sin. We're knowingly doing stuff. That yeah. in the moment we're doing it, we know we're in sin in that moment. Mm-hmm. And Jesus is just right there. And we're just like, sorry, Jesus. I'm just going to sin right now, but I'll check you yeah. later. Yeah. Okay. And are then you, are, you descri- are you describing me? And then <laughs> I'm describing me. Lord. I'm describing me. And then, and then what happens? Satan instantly comes in and Mark's over here talking about, I need to hear from God. I ain't hearing from nothing but the devil at that point. Because I'm getting jacked. I'm getting convicted, right? I'm getting, I'm, I'm hearing from the Holy Spirit. I'm getting convicted, but at the same time, I'm getting condemned over here, right? Right, right. So, Mark, you guys started this whole thing, I think, because God led you to. I Jamal and I went to Promise Keepers. I don't think you had a premonition one day, uh, Kingdom Servants Rising, and God came down and put a bullet on your forehead. Right, 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 right. You just did it. God just manifested it, you know? And now people are getting saved and people are hearing the word of God and, and people are getting discipled. And, and it was because of the desire from the Holy Spirit and the willingness to just 
take a little leap of faith and have something happen. Every day, we need to be willing to say, Holy Spirit, I want to walk in the spirit today. Yeah. I, I want to try to fight my sin today. Amen. Like, whatever that sin is, for men, porn, addictions, you know, laziness, gluttony, you know, you just, just whatever yeah. the Holy Spirit is saying your specific stick is at this moment, that's the one we need to be trying to fight the most individually. Yes. And then we'll have more power to walk in the Holy Spirit. You know, you, you, I'm going through a lot of stuff right now, personally. You know, Adam, if I can interject something. Yeah, please. You know, Jesus Christ said, if any of you wish to be my disciple, what's the key word here? Deny. Deny, Deny yourself. Yeah. Um, submission is the key word. In Amen. anything we do, any decision we make, whether to buy Bitcoin or whatever, we have to go to the Lord and say, Lord, should I do this? Right. Lord, I mean, what's the first thing a person does when he first meets Jesus? He submits, he surrenders. And he yeah. wants us to be like, if anyone wants to be my disciple, take up your cross daily and come follow me. He didn't say, get beside me, get in front of me. He said, get behind him and follow. Let him take the lead of your life. Because we can't do it. And he says to do it daily. Daily. That's a big time word in that text you're talking about, Walter. It's not, it's not, it's not every once in a while I'll pick up my word. Every once in a while. Or when thing, when the going gets tough, then I'll, I'll go to God. You're not going to get strong that way, man. It's not going to happen. Jamal. It's not. I think it's two ways, though. Like, I agree 100% with what Adam said. But I also think there's another route. So that route, you can go. You know, I went that route. I went through my divorce, went through a lot of pain, and I just went. I just went. And I went into a lot of weird stuff, stupid stuff. I had to re get back right with God. And it wasn't God leading me that direction. But you know what's interesting? That's one way. The other way is this. Check this out. It's pretty cool. It's the most successful way in the world. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, the Bible, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it, for then you will make your way prosperous. That's a person that's going after God and asking God which direction. And then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you, Adam, Jamal, Mark, be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. This is someone that is saying, I don't know where to go. Direct me. So I believe what Adam said, but I also believe there's another section where it's like success. And this one, of course, God will lead me. But I want to go over here because I want to be totally, yeah. wholly surrendered. Dude, yeah. and that's hard to do. It's so, easier for me to say that, but it's hard to do. I'm done. Drop the mic. The thing is, we can't throw God a curveball. We, we can't do it. So no matter what we do, we're still in God's plan. So yeah, and, here, and here's the thing, Mark. You know, because I remember that, you know, the divorce. And... Okay. And, and here's the thing, you know, when you say you just didn't wait and you just went straight to it, right? Well, what were you going straight to? My flesh and then trying to follow God at the same time. Yeah. And so that's why the, that's why the scripture says, so I say to you, walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Right. I was gratifying, dude. I was so here's gratifying. the thing. We're not talking about somebody who's like just walking around trying to gratify the set, the flesh. You, <laughs> We're talking about somebody who is going but walking in the spirit. Oh boy, I got you. Right? Uh -huh. And and so there is that distinction. You are gonna get in trouble if you're just going out there doing it willy-nilly and you're in the flesh. But we've all done that. We're doing it right now half the time. And it gets us in trouble all the time. Every time. What I'm saying is, in me personally. 
you know, uh, I need to repent because we need, we need, dude, the times are crazy, man. I'm getting attacked by my family. We're getting attacked by the country. We're getting attacked by the demons. We're getting attacked by the media. I mean, we're just getting, we're just getting bombarded, you know? But it's like, what are we doing to stay in the spirit? Bitcoin, Ethereum, ABA, you know, it's like, okay, fine. Money, things, you know, while your marriages are breaking down, while you're mm. freaking being defeated because you're not in the spirit. Mm. Mm. That's big. Come on, Adam. I know you got more, baby. Come on, baby. Adam's preaching. Come on, Adam. You got to walk in the power <laughs> of Jesus Christ to, in, in order to fulfill the daily call that the father has to do whatever he wants you to do. And that's why it says in Romans that our bodies, when we wake up in the morning, we're supposed to wake up in the morning and say, okay, how do you want to use my body? Man. What do you want me to do? Where do you want me to go? Who do you want me to serve? You know, and, and who do you want me to talk to about Jesus? Right? Whose body is it? Yeah, it, it's his body. We're supposed to be living sacrifices, pleasing to God. And we can't do that always. And, you know, I'm talking to myself here, guys. You know, yeah. you know, well, I'm I'm saying, right now, with all this crap I'm personally going through, and I, I'm not going to get into all of it, but it's hard. And like, it takes you out of your ability to like think right, you know? But even now, God wants to use me. God mm. wants to tell somebody about Jesus through me, you know, and everybody here. You know, so look, we have to learn right now how to walk by the spirit and be close to him. And it's not just about the word, the word, word, word. It's about the word and the spirit and the father. It's the Trinity. We need we need the Trinity. Hallelujah, man. We need the Trinity. What's the second part of that scripture, Adam? Which one? Which Walk one? by the Spirit. You so will not gratify the desire of the flesh. You will not feel full of the lust of the flesh. Well, here, here, here's one for you. James chapter 4, verse 7 and 8. Submit, therefore, to God. The first thing. Yep. Submit. Boom. Resist, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Now, how many of how many of you right now? How many of you feel like right, right now that the devil has fleed from you? Not fully, because I'm like back and forth a little bit. I feel like I'm getting blasted. Mm -hmm. No. So I must I'm have ready for an altar call here. Yeah. Well, I, we're all getting blasted. You no, know? I mean, dude, I was a I mean, I had somebody steal almost, you know, significant amount of money from me. I freaking had avowed Luciferians try and recruit me. I was offered human adrenal chrome. Oh, that's so we are all being beaten down. The, the world is coming for us. We can't worship. You know, and you know what? I'm seeing God push us into the early church. And one of you guys said, we're a church. And I just want to tell you, brother, I know you're getting hurt. It's going through you. And I can't even tell you what it is that you're going through. But I want you to know, at least the Luciferians aren't coming after you and your family yet. I don't even care. I, mean, I preach the gospel to every single Adam, one. I love that. Holds bar, dude. I'm talking Adam. serious. Yeah. I wouldn't, well, care. Uh, you know. I would preach the demons out of them, dude. Yeah, baby. At the end Praise of the Lord. Luciferians can't do well, anything. I have Jesus. Oh, man, what I'm talking you, about man. is I'm a sinner. Right. I, I, I hate the things that I do. Woo. Things that I don't want to do, I keep on doing them. Roman and I'm seven, baby. Jesus, why am I doing the things that I keep knowing in my mind I don't want to do? Because you're in the flesh. That's and right. It's as, long as, as, as long as you're in the flesh, brother, the flesh serves the law of sin and death. 
But you know what though? All, all, but see, all of us dip back into the flesh from time to time. We all do. It's true. Every single body does. We 